Good morning and good afternoon. Dear conference participants and fellow members of the UFRO network. My name is Gunn Lidestav and I, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this session where we together uh, will tackle the gender uh, as a cross-cutting issue for UFRO both as an organization and as a network of researchers. We hope that all of you will feel invited uh, to a wider discussion on uh, about, for example, uh, the current unequal representation within the UFRO and the importance to pay attention to internal practices of research um, and its potential effects on knowledge production. Furthermore, to what extent changes to the better requires commitments by all of us. And to faci facilitate the wider discussion, then, yeah. So, uh, we have organized the program as follows. To start with, I will say a few words about the task force its main purpose and the main activities, followed by statements why we as a task force consider that representation matters in forest science. The broader scene will then be set by four flash talks by Dr. Alice Ludwig from uh, Buku, Dr. Earl student Rocio Garcia from the Institute of Research for Natural Resources and Agroecology and Rural Development in Argentina. Dr. Earl student Barbara Oehler at Buku. Dr. Theodora Rogrela from the University of Padua and Dr. Ida Wallin from the Swedish University of Agriculture and Sciences. Then we will look more into UFRO as an organization uh, with the help of Dr. Elias Andersson, uh, who will present results from the organizational analysis that has been uh, conducted by the task force. After that, you are all invited to give your opinion uh, to the ma these matters to a, a Mentimeter poll. The, and the result of this uh, exercise will be displayed uh, at the end of the panel discussion. A panel discussion where we invite, um, it will be moderated by Professor Tepo Hoyala, who also is a task force member. In the panel, we will have our UFRO president, uh, John Parota, the UFRO executive director, uh, Dr. Alexander Book, Dr. Kalpana Giri, who is the program officer, now uh, um, working at the World Resource Institute, uh, previously at RECOFT, and she will attend the session uh, virtually, and we hope the, techni the technique will be with us. Uh, and we also have the doctoral student, Teresa Clara Loch, who is the IFSA Gender Commissioner. Now, um, very shortly about uh, the task force. We started our work uh, in 2019 and hopefully we will be able to finish it by, by the UFRO Congress 2024. Uh, it comprised members of various regions and UFRO divisions. I'm the coordinator and the main purpose is, uh, is to map the gender balance within UFRO and analyze and identify bar barriers to gender equality. Uh, so our activities is, as said, to do the analysis and, uh, of gender structures within UFRO. We, will all, we are also uh, um, monitor, let's say, uh, evaluating or um, uh, gender equality initiatives in different parts of the world. Uh, hopefully, we will also can um, support UFRO by having um, an, a list of expertise on gender research, 
provide the basis for an action plan and help organizing gender uh, um, equality activities during the 2024 Congress. So, why uh, are we doing this? Uh, basically, it's because we think that representation matters in forest science as well as in other uh, sciences. So, and similar to other organizations, we believe that UFRO needs to consider and take action regarding how the current gender imbalance impact on its performance and how issues of gender equality and gendered organizational awareness may support the mission of UFRO to foster development of science-based solutions to forest-related challenges. We acknowledge that in professional development, access to formal and informal networks are crucial. Uh, research also show that the male domination of network remains a persistent structural barrier uh, for women. Restricted network access denies involvement in the exchange and creation of tactic knowledge and access to organizational resources and power. So issues of inclusion and equality are highly uh, significant for both the knowledge production uh, within the network and the perceived relevance of the network from a society perspective. So this brings us to the matter of scientific quality, which refers both to the quality from the perspective of the span and complexity, as well as excellence. So uh, then um, I will, that said, um, invite uh, Dr. Alice Ludwig to give a flash talk uh, on creating new spaces for gender balance in the wood value chain, women leadership uh, and management. Please. Thank you. So we will now, no, it's only one slide. Okay. It's a flash talk. <laughs> <laughs> it's on. Um, yeah. We want to create some new spaces for thinking and I want to provide some new thoughts here. Um, and the background of my talk is a study that we did, it was financed by the Austrian Ministry uh, two years ago on the connections between gender equality and resilience in the forest-based value chains. Um, so the question is maybe, <laughs> why did we study this? For us, um, resilience is understood in this study as uh, something that is a robustness and preparedness of organizations towards challenges, crisis, yeah? you na name it. Yesterday we talked about it. There is uh, economic challenges, new societal challenges, new societal demands, climate change, the paradigm shift that we currently observe towards more biodiversity, etc. Yeah? So how do we come to this? That we have evidence that, um, uh, and we have a lot of evidence on this, that diverse teams are more innovative under certain circumstances, and that innovativeness would contribute to resilience of firms, organizations, and enterprises. So the question that I want to put in focus here is the question is, are gender equal organizations more resilient? Mm -hmm. And um, if we transfer this now to IUFRO, it would mean, would UFRO as a networking organization become more resilient with more inclusion? Okay, let's come to our results. What did we do? We have asked the members of the Austrian Wald Dialogue, it's a huge stakeholder organization with 800 members and other forest related organizations. Uh, we got a response rate of 204. For th on three things, the resilience measures that they had, that is preparedness towards crisis, we build an innovation index, and we have asked them on the importance they have, they attribute to gender equality, diversity, and other categories within the organizations. Final results, two main points. We did not find any correlation between the, uh, the importance that the organizations attributed to gender balance and the perceptions on the strengthening of innovation and resilience in the organizations and firm. So this we cannot prove, not at all. Huh? But what we found is, 
we found the highest scores in the innovation, innovation sum index that we built, they were achieved by all the organizations that we asked, which ranked ethnic diversity with highest importance. Hmm. What would that mean? And I come now to the end for you through as a networking organization. First of all, it's not only gender that is at stance here, but broader categories of inclusion and diversity. What does it mean? <laughs> this realm goes beyond something that one single task force can do or what even IUFRO can do because when we look at gender as a structural, structural category, it's also a societal thing on perceptions, knowledge, who is, has specific roles, etc. cetera. Um, but sensibilization and awareness as is planned, for instance, with the youth from MOOC, and we will hear about this today, is something that can be one step into this direction. It's planned right now. Huh? And I want to finish now with what I think is most important, because as you see in the title, we looked also at women in leadership and management positions and uh, <laughs> high level stakeholders, of course. It's five to 6%. Yeah? So what does that mean? The critical mass is much too small. Yeah? We know from literature, it must be 35% at least to move things forward. So what does that mean for us all? We need to bring everybody on board. Yeah? That means we cannot do this with deal with this alone. And I'm quite positive with, for this because I see a lot of men who are really not uh, informed of some traditional roles of masculinity they have or should up should uh, fulfill. Yeah? That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Alice. Thank you very much. And now I invite uh, Rocio uh, Garcia uh, to present her uh, study in a flash talk mode. Okay. Hi to everyone. Uh, my name is Rocio. I'm a PhD student from Argentina. Um, and today I'm going to talk about the role of women in forest bureaucracy forest bureaucracies in my country. Um, as we know, forest lands are the territory where uh, economic interests and conservation interests meet. And Argentina being a federal country has uh, its provinces where the forest bureaucracies are the ones in charge of administ administering these uh, forest lands. And in some studies that they were made in, in my country, um, they say that when these forest bureaucracies are under the environmental ministry, they are more efficient in uh, controlling deforestation. So what we uh, try to um, yeah, answer uh, is which are the structural factors of these forest bureaucracies that determine the efficiency on controlling deforestation. And today I'm going to focus on gender. Okay, so until now we have, uh, we have studied uh, 12 provinces of the 23 that Argentina has. Uh, we use data for se from semi-structured interviews, official documents, and web information of these bureaucracies. Um, and we use a methodology of qualitative, quantitative, quantitative analysis and process tracing in a specific case study. So we um, take as the response variable the application of a forest conservation law that is the main legal instrument in Argentina aiming to uh, give incentive, incentives to prevent uh, deforestation. And we have uh, the indicator of the application of this law, the area of the province under management plan or conservation plan and the deforestation rate. And we took as explanatory variables, the structure factors as the number of employees that these forest bureaucracies have the profession of the people there, the levels of hierarchy uh, 
like with the aiming to see how long is the bureaucratic process and uh, the woman in the highest positions from the direction or see, uh, similar um, bureaucracy to ministry. Sorry. Oops. Yeah. Uh, so the preliminary results uh, and discussion from this, um, from the results of all the bureaucracies that we had, we only had three that had an equal number of women and men and only one that had much majority of women. And this province is exactly the only one that still has not implemented the law uh, in, in settlers' territory. And the study case that we had shows uh, a similar tendency. So uh, we also made interviews to settlers and we could see their perspective when women uh, were in these uh, forest bureaucracy charges. And we discussed uh, what happens when women in a group uh, in, inside a, a male sector uh, dominant as it is a forest sector uh, that can uh, be in danger of widening the gender gap. And um, also we saw that the women in, in the forest bureaucracies that could um, uh, like defend their responsibilities try to it takes some characteristic of a male social constructor. And last, the, these explanations could be because in Argentina, uh, there is still, although there is a, a, a big develop, uh, a big deconstruction, sorry, uh, an incomplete citizenship of women that give advantages to men in important employment positions. Thank you. Thank you very much for these insights. And then I now invite uh, Barbara uh, Ullerer to the stage. Yes, you are there. Thank you. Thank you, Gun, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. Forestry has historically been a male dominated sector. To illustrate this, I brought the data of the UNECE region. On average, in the European forestry workforce, the share of women is about 14%. And there are even fewer women in decision-making bodies and interest groups than would correspond to their share in the workforce. In Austria, where I conducted my study, this number is even lower with 10% uh, of women in the, in the share in the workforce. What we have here is an underrepresentation disproportionate to the share of women in the total population, and therefore an underrepresentation of a considerable share of the population among actors in the forestry sector. I am a curious person, and I'm sure many of you can relate to that, so I decided to look into this. And what I did was I got in touch with the most prominent women identifying leaders in the Austrian forestry sector and did a series of in-depth qualitative interviews with them. I wanted to go beyond mere numbers as a measure of gender equality. And I asked them what barriers they had personally experienced during their careers and what barriers they generally saw for women trying to enter the Austrian forestry sector. And this is what I found. There are internal barriers, meaning barriers that are within the women, they're on the right side of this slide. And then there are external barriers and many, many more. So they're rooted within the structures and they're on the left side of this. What was most striking, however, was that none of the women said that they had not had to overcome any barriers. All of them had. And one barrier that everyone mentioned in one or another way was family care responsibilities. One interviewee, for example, said that after she had a child, no one talked to her about her work um, anymore, but just about the child. And another one posed the question, you're a young mother and therefore not suitable for this. They wouldn't say you became a young father a few weeks or months ago, and that's why you're not suitable. 
I didn't stop at this, however, not at the barriers. I was also interested to see how they overcame them. So I asked them about their strategies. And when I asked them about their personal strategies, they told me exactly that, their strategies, plus a small number of circumstances that had made it easier for them. They're in the box at the bottom. Later in the interview, I also asked them what they thought was necessary in general to overcome gender specific barriers in the forestry sector. And then interesting, interestingly enough, they shared much fewer uh, actual strategies and twice as many circumstances that need to change. These results suggest, suggest that it is the structures that need to change. And it is not a women's issue as it is often framed, but one of the entire sector and society at large. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara. Well, we have spent some time now on uh, <clears throat> talking about barriers and circumstances. Uh, the next flash talk will be uh, more about how, what we can do about it. So I invite Dr. Todora Rogleila, Rogleila and I, Dr. Ida Valin to the stage, uh, and they will uh, give us some um, examples or suggestions for uh, how we can make a change. Thank you, Gunt, for a very nice introduction. Good morning. It's my pleasure to be here. I am coming from University of Padova, and I'm happy, very happy to share with you that this year we are celebrating 800 years, making the University of Padova one of the oldest in Europe. There is another thing that might be less known about my university, and this is the lady on the picture. Do you ever heard about Helena Lucrezia Cornaro Piscopia? No? She was the first world's female graduate obtaining a degree in philosophy from the University of Padova. That happened in distant 1678. Although Elena got her diploma 344 years ago, we are still looking into this kind of picture today. What this map is showing us is something that Alice already mentioned about critical mass. And what is important to notice here is the share of women in research in the world. In average, we have 30% of women in research and science. That might uh, seem troubling to some and less to the others, but it makes quite a problem if you're struggling with gender balance and geographical balance when organizing a session. And this is just a trivial issue. So when we are coming back to forestry sector, and we already heard that from Barbara, the situation is even worse. Gender issues are underrepresented in forest education. For example, if you try to find the courses and the faculties that are offering the courses on forest and gender in forestry, you will find two in Europe. And it is quite questionable if this offer is permanent. But I was very happy to learn from my friend Ida that we can solve this problem together. And Ida is going to tell you how. Thank you for that. Uh, pass to Dora. Um, in order to solve this gender gap issue, what we need is awareness raising, not only in education, but also in the sector and in academia. So in awareness raising, there is a problem because if we want that in education, there is a lack of trainers, globally speaking. There are only two courses, so we need capacity or we can do as we are now doing, developing a massive open online course on the topic of gender equality and diversity in the forest sector, building on the great competence globally that the task force at IUFRO has. And this course will, is planned to run for the first time on the 8th of March, 2024. So the International Women's Day in good time for the IUFRO Congress in Stockholm, of course. And so this is the first ever MOOC on gender equality and diversity in the forest sector. And this will have a global reach. It will be on the platform Future Learn. It will reach students in fields like forestry, agriculture, rural development, sustainability studies, business studies. And it will be a module-based 
uh, course, meaning that you can integrate parts of this course in your different courses and curricula. And it will also be compatible with ECTS and microcredits. Professionals as well as students uh, will be able to take this course. And with that, we of course like to encourage you to support us and join the development of the first MOOC on gender equality and diversity in the forest sector. And you are very welcome to contact us how you can support us. So thank you very much. Yes, I, I really, I'm really grateful to, to Ida and to Dora uh, who have brought this um, uh, method or approach uh, to the task force. And, and I'm so happy that we as a task force also could introduce it to you as an opportunity to make a change. Uh, now let's um, get back to uh, UFRO as an organization and uh, the structural barriers, uh, keeping in mind the opportunities as well. Uh, and to this end, I uh, invite uh, Dr. Elias Andersson from the University of Agriculture and Sciences as all, and also a member of the task force uh, to uh, present uh, some results, not all, some results from the organizational analysis that we have conducted. Please, Elias. Yes, uh, thank you, Gun. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, as Gun said, I'm, I'm a member, I'm a deputy coordinator of the, the task force, but I'm also the coordinator of the UFR unit on gender and forestry. And I'm also the vice dean uh, with responsibilities for gender equality and equal opportunities at the uh, forest faculty uh, at Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences. So this, at at moment, these research positions and the engagement with UFRO uh, quite a, very much overlap. And I will, as Gun said, tell you a little bit about the results that we have so far. And we're still aiming with the report and uh, recommendations for, for, for the year for 2024. Uh, so these are sort of preliminary uh, and uh, some of them at least, uh, some of them are, are maybe a bit more uh, set uh, as you will see. But what we're doing here is then trying to grasp and, and look at UFRO and see how it is organized and what type of barriers and opportunities that we can identify within the networks uh, in order to improve uh, inclusion in general, but also more specifically with, with regards to, to, to gender. Uh, and in this organizational analysis or the report where I'm uh, sort of in charge of together with uh, Maria Johansson from UMI University, uh, but in all, it's the report and the work is all, all very much a collective work of the, the task force where different members are contributing with, with different aspects and, and um, initiatives with, within it. Uh, and, um, and we are here within the report are combining different types of methods. We are, have, have done surveys. We are doing sort of organizational analysis in terms of documents and structures and statistics. Um, and, and, and so on, um, and uh, uh, in order to get sort of more comprehensive uh, pictures of, uh, of UFRO um, in, in general. Uh, and if we look at the sort of the UFRO structure, uh, we can see that, that uh, men are dominating on most levels. Uh, the reason why the headquarters are within brackets is due to that we know that we need to update those figures because they're a little bit outdated, but other ones are, are there and, 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 and looks at this, uh, which we very much think is, uh, is, is a challenge that we need to address and also to reflect upon why it looks like this and also why we see this kind of uh, hierarchical, uh, just, uh, the difference between different levels uh, and what implications that, that has for, for your probe. Uh, and if we look then at the, the office holders, 
uh, we see that uh, from the last period to this period, we see that the share of, of, of uh, women that are office holder is increasing in most uh, divisions, uh, uh, while there are others that are, 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 are not. Um, but in general, it, it's increasing, but also that the, the share of, of, of women is, uh, is lower uh, in general. Uh, and we also see that overall that women to higher extent are deputy coordinators rather than coordinators within when they are office holders, uh, which also then uh, marks this kind of um, discrepancy between uh, what types of positions that men and women has within Yucca. Uh, and if we then move over to as a start of the, the task force work, we did uh, a survey and uh, which we now uh, are going to repeat once more. Uh, to uh, all the office holders, uh, which we uh, uh, got a little bit more than 150 responses, which only response rate of 18%, which we hope we will improve uh, the second time around. Uh, and, with, and within the responses, it was about uh, a little bit more men than women responded. Uh, about two-thirds uh, two of them had been in Europe for four, five years or less, uh, but also that... Uh, a little bit more majority of, of deputy coordinators. But we also saw in relation to what they responded was that sort of colleagues and the networking uh, is a crucial aspect of, of inclusion within or recruitment to, to UFRO, where we see both the internal, internal colleagues in terms of that the, your colleagues in the organizations where you are working that act as a, as a recruiter to, to UFRO, or sort of external colleagues in terms of networks and colleagues that you have sort of outside of your your working place but those are the most uh, important ways in for for the office holders that responded to this survey uh, but uh, but what we also see with regards to inequalities uh, gender inequalities that that men of course uh, women uh, of course to a higher degree than men experience this is a barrier and challenge for their participations of course, it's also important to, to highlight that these are office holders that has been uh, included within UFRO. So there's, we still need to think a little bit more about the ones that, that are, haven't really potentially felt that, uh, that UFRO was the right choice for them. So um, that is another aspect that we need to, to consider when, we, we, when, we, when we're studying the data from the survey is that these are also people that have uh, much knowledge and much inf uh, under good insights about but Euphro, but still they are uh, within it. And what we also see that in, in general that men to higher uh, extent feel that uh, Euphro is important uh, for networking for their professional development uh, than women uh, a little bit more. Uh, while then, of course, then that um, women to higher extent also feel that it's important to improve gender equality issues in, with regards to, uh, to networking within, within GIFRO. Uh, and these were sort of the, the, the results in general that we have had from the survey and some, some, some reflections that we have so far from the work that we have, have been doing in terms of the, the organizational analysis is that, of course, uh, as we have talked about before, uh, UFRO uh, provides important resources in terms of, of networking and, and opportunities for, uh, for professional development, but it's also sort of dis distributed resources within itself. And that's why it's important to also look, about, look about to the barriers of inclusion with regards to, to UFRO, because uh, un unequal access is an, a, a challenge. And if we look at UFRO then, with, is a large organization, uh, 600 members uh, organizations and so on, which also adds to this kind of complexity of trying to also, uh, the transparency of actually understanding you for which we, uh, Marie and I, uh, and also the, the task force in general uh, have struggled a little bit trying to understand all the bits and pieces, although that we sort of still uh, put in a, a decent amount of time at least uh, in trying. So there is this kind of challenge with transparency, but also sort of identification. What is actually your firm? Why is it relevant for me with regards to this time of different, the complexity and the size of it? 
Uh, and what we also found out is this kind of organization, challenge of organizational identity in terms of, okay, what is really UFO? Is it this, an organization? Is it a union? Or is it a network? Because uh, that is, in different areas, that's important in, in relation to different types of aspects. But that also adds to this kind of complexity of, of what, what is we really UFO and how should we engage with it and how should it be uh, dealing with these type of issues. Uh, where we also see that that adds to the sort of organizational structure and also the opportunities in terms of governance. How do we steer your flow uh, and, and, and so on. Where we also have this kind of uh, whether or not your flow is a, is a top uh, from the bottom up organization or to what extent it should be regarded as a sort of a top down organization. And where we also see that these kind of structures uh, are a little bit mixing, uh, which both adds so to the strength of a UFO, but also adds sort of to, to its complexity. Uh, and the ways in, as we talked a bit before, where many people have vital roles in, in order to provide support and, and, and access to UFO, there are also this kind of risk that uh, since most, mo much emphasis is put on the individuals, that they also conscious or unconsciously act as gatekeepers uh, in terms of who is included and who is not included. Uh, and then we also have sort of the challenge, as we talked about before, or Gun mentioned before, about this kind of that we know from literature that informal networks also have a challenge in terms of that is also have a risk of reproducing the, the present norms and structures. While it's also a very key function of your pro that this kind of informal network that we are doing and in conferences and so on, which also is a strength, also could be a, a challenge in terms of of inclusion, but also in terms of how do we, how do we handle these issues and how do we uh, actually uh, promote change uh, with regards to, to these aspects. So these are some of the reflections that we have so far from the, the report. The idea is that the report will be uh, sort of completed um, or the organizational analysis will be, be completed by the end of this year. And then the task force collectively will work on the recommendations of uh, how, how should we uh, move forward? What will the task force recommend with regards to these aspects? So hopefully during spring, we will be able to tell you a bit more about this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elias, uh, for uh, those uh, for this report and insights. Uh, but I also would like to stress then that the work that we are doing as a task force is really a work in progress or an ongoing work, meaning that what we now have uh, are presenting uh, also will be the input to, uh, to the further discussion. And uh, I, I will stress one more time, you are all invited to participate in this uh, discussion because uh, you are the network, you are the organization. Uh, and that said, uh, I will now announce uh, that uh, we will have a Mentimeter poll to uh, the participants, both in the room and uh, participating uh, online. Uh, a number of questions will, will be uh, introduced. And uh, to help with this, also technically, but also monitoring, uh, moderating this. Uh, I invite Te Professor Teppo Hoyola to um, take the, sea, the stage and, and to um, tell us how we will uh, go about with this. So. Thank you, Gun. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Good evening, everybody here in the auditorium in Vienna, and also online. Uh, you are already seeing uh, the first question and uh, the address. You should uh, go with your uh, mobile or uh, any device that you might have uh, uh, connected to the internet and answer those questions. Uh, but while doing so, I'm just uh, framing a little bit about uh, what is uh, behind uh, all of this. So. Uh, uh, you have been hearing uh, words about equality, uh, diversity, uh, and uh, inclusion. And I hope everybody has been uh, 
uh, listening carefully, uh, thinking a little bit and uh, relaxing, sitting back. And now it's time to be a little bit more active. We share this, uh, that includes me as well. So I also need to be a little bit more active because I'm the moderator here in the panel. Uh, but we really uh, would like you to have uh, an opportunity to say uh, your word and your opinion on these matters. Uh, there might be some inspiration, some ideas, uh, some keywords uh, from these flash talks and uh, presentation by Elias and, uh, and the briefing, uh, brief introduction by Gunn. And uh, obviously we cannot invite everybody uh, to sit here uh, as the uh, panelists but we kind of uh, want to have you as a, a, a crowd of panelists to say at, le at least uh, uh, something about your views. So there are these uh, four questions. Three of uh, uh, them are first uh, simple multiple choice questions. And it's important to stress now that the fourth question uh, is uh, a question that we invite you to answer with only one word. Please do not write a sentence, but only one word, because that will be uh, uh, the, the responses will be used to generate the word cloud. All the results of this poll will be announced at the end of the panel. So it will be a kind of a hidden secret for, uh, for the time being. So uh, a little bit of excitement and let's see how we will wrap up uh, with these uh, answers to the poll. Uh, after the panel discussion. So uh, one more important thing, I just remind everybody online and also in this auditorium that uh, we will have also an opportunity for audience questions, uh, uh, both here in, in person and uh, hopefully also uh, online. So if there are uh, some important questions that you would like to ask, please uh, kind of a consider them, write them down, not to forget, or, or write them in the chat. And let's see, uh, we uh, make sure to, to have some time for, uh, for addressing those questions. And if, if not uh, able to, uh, due to time constraints to answer everything uh, in the chat, there will be some of our task force uh, persons to, to kind of discuss with you online. Okay, so that's about the poll. Hopefully you will all uh, find the the menti.com address and use this uh, code uh, to enter the questions and answer the questions. And uh, meanwhile, uh, we will keep this poll open and uh, we'll close it later uh, before showing the results. But now I think it's uh, time for uh, inviting our uh, panelists here and, and Gun will uh, say a few words about that. Yes. Uh... Thank you, Teppo. Uh, the panel, um, we are pleased and to, to invite uh, our uh, president, Dr. John Parota, uh, and also our uh, executive director, Alexander Buck, uh, together with um, Kalpana Giri, who is a task force member, but also in this case, we, uh, we asked her also trying to represent, uh, let's say an external organization an ex uh, that um, will collaborate uh, with Jufro. So we will bring in that perspective. And then also uh, not least important is uh, our students. So I invite uh, Teresa Clara Loch, who is the IFSA Gender Commissioner to the States. And then uh, meanwhile, the, um, the poll is running. Tepo is timekeeping. Uh, you can just socialize or prepare or become more nervous or whatever, <laughs> or more relaxed. Uh, and uh, also be curious about the result of the, uh, the Mentimeter poll. So a few minutes for relaxation. Thank you. 
All right, maybe we don't use the few minutes. Uh, we'll uh, keep the poll open, so you may continue answering if you did not uh, finalize that. Uh, and uh, we'll uh, start with our uh, panel discussion. We have basically uh, three questions, and we have uh, something like 50 minutes time, uh, including uh, the audience questions and answers. So the three questions will be about uh, the reasons for engaging gender aspects uh, in our uh, view from network, uh, the challenges uh, that uh, are there on the way, and the uh, actions that could take us towards the desired outcomes. So uh, with this briefing, uh, let's start from the first question. Uh, dear panelists, what do you think from your perspective, from your experience, uh, what are the three most important reasons why to engage in gender equality matters within UFRO? And uh, we'll start with, uh, with John Parotta. Please, John. Yes, thank, thank you, Tepo. The mic is functioning. It should yeah. be on. Yeah, no, this, this issue is actually fundamental to UFRO's uh, current strategy. UFRO has a strategy which is developed it's up, it's, it, by, the, by the board of UFRO, which consists of members of, of representatives of the, of, of the divisions, division coordinators, as well as task forces, uh, plus other, other office holders, including vice presidents and presidents and president and executive director, among others. So, so collectively, we developed, a, we developed a strategy, which we do every five years, and central to this um, is the issue of, of, um, of inclusion in general. Um, it starts with our, our core values, you know, which are networking, diversity, and integrity. And as, as uh, Alice, uh, uh, in my view, very rightly pointed out, um, Diversity is, it, it, it goes beyond gender. I mean, gender is central to this, but it also, we're also talking about you know, geographic diversity, cultural diversity, and all of this is very, very important to us because it impacts the quality and relevance of our science. If we, if we are not taking advantage of the opportunities to diversify our membership, our office holders, our work, uh, we're actually looking at the world with one eye closed and perhaps the other one not seeing particularly well. Uh, so the kinds of questions we ask and how, how we go about our work and how we go about uh, communicating our work, it's vitally important for us to um, have, a, have, uh, have a diverse inclusion uh, within our uh, active membership. So I'll just stop there. Thank you. Thank you, John. So we'll uh, progress towards uh, from internal uh, views from uh, uh, towards more external views. So I'm kind of asking Kalpana because uh, you are uh, representing an, an organization uh, external to UFRO to wait until, uh, until we have had some responses from Alexander and, and Teresa. So Alexander, please, your turn. The three most important reasons from your perspective on why to engage in these matters. Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, I really would like to, to thank the, the task force Gun and every member of the task force um, for the great work that you're doing all together. Um, I, I think we can, as UFRO, <laughs> really consider ourselves to be very fortunate to have such a, a great group of experts on, on that the, such important topic. So really a big thank you uh, to the group. Um, so John has already mentioned, you know, really the, the significance of gender equality for the, the quality of the, you know, the, the science collaboration you throw. But I think, you know, one other aspect that is very important is this aspect, this more individual uh, aspect of professional development. And I think that also came out quite clearly in Elias' report that, you know, um, a scientist in UFRO consider, you know, a UFRO to be relevant um, for their own professional development. So, so, and I think that is a very convincing argument. But what I also found very compelling was what uh, Alice told us about resilience and innovation. And I look very much forward actually also to learning more about this because um, just to exemplify this, uh, you know, not in the context of UFRO, but yesterday we had a meeting from colleagues in Ukraine 
And I mean, they actually pointed out, for example, what an important role women now play in Ukraine in terms of forestry administration, because all the men, they are not available at the moment. So really, <laughs> at times of crisis, it seems to me it's always the women who then actually carry the heavy load and, uh, and, um, and really uh, do the heavy lifting, it seems to me. I also want to, to make one third point. You asked us to make three points, and John already alluded to that, and that is in general the issue of diversity. Because I think you know this diversity in, in all respects matters. And in the Euro Secretariat, for example, when I was appointed to my position, the Secretariat, most of the staff uh, actually came from Austria. And we made a very deliberate effort to actually, you know, also involve colleagues uh, from that uh, come from different parts of the world. So right now, the Secretariat is kind of like a mini cosmos of Euro as a whole with the 16 staff members from nine countries. Thank you, Alexander. I think now it's a perfect time to ask also uh, from Teresa your point of view, please. Yeah, hello, also from my side. Um, I think the student's perspective is maybe a little bit different. Um, I see the points you made, but from our side, it's very much what, uh, how Yufu is setting the scene and discourse. So from a student's perspective, it's quite interesting, like who is participating in this knowledge creation right now? and because um, IUFU can be a professional network. That's kind of, that's what we see as students. When we start forest, we want to um, see ourselves. And IUFU, of course, have an overlap with our lecturers. So the people who are in the IUFU network are actually also mostly, oh, depending on the university, the people who are lecturing us. So as if IUFU is going forwards and gender diversity, it can also have an impact on our students. Um, yeah, yeah, on our, our education directly. And that's kind of brings me to the next point, which is the exemplary role we see in IUFU. So coming to a conference like this can be amazing for young students. And then it's also quite interesting who we see on the conference, who's speaking, who's the president, who, would you, who do we see and who as maybe non-male um, female young students who we, where we can see ourselves. And then maybe the third point again um, is, Basically, overall, from a student's perspective, also the question of fairness. So as young students, we want to see ourselves, no matter of the gender, on the scene. And yeah, coming back to the exemplary role, I think it's very important to show more diversity in the network, which then influences young students and admires them and encourages them to actually speak up and go on stages. Thanks. Thank you very much, Teresa. Thank you all uh, three uh, panelists here uh, in the auditorium in Vienna. And then thank you for Kalpana, uh, for the patients uh, waiting for your turn. We can perfectly see you. Uh, let's uh, hear you as well. So what are your three main points uh, of why to engage in these matters? Thanks, Teppo. I uh, hope you can hear me. Very well. All right, thank you so much. Um, in my opinion, there are three main arguments uh, on, on this. I think first is for equality of science. And I really want to emphasize this fact because science, including forest science, is not monolithic. Uh, so we really need to think of plural knowledges and different perspectives that are related to forest data and knowledge production process. Using a gender lens as a social science methodology helps in exploring dimensions of power relations and diverse type of knowledge systems. In particular, it helps to understand knowledge held by minority actors such as women, indigenous group. And we have known that such knowledge can be very, very useful to inform, enrich and make the forest science much more diverse and equal. So coming from that methodology, I think is a network for you for why it is also important so that uh, UFRO as a network can become more equal and inclusive. Uh, and given that UFRO is a network, it can also be considered as a resource base. And this resource base should be open um, and provide equal opportunities in terms of access, representation, and voices to different types of stakeholders. So using a gender lens actually allows different types of intersecting stakeholders, their different barriers and issues, and more practical solutions. And third argument I would say is that gender equality can make UFRO more relevant among forest constituencies. And I think UFRO needs to be relevant, right? Uh, the forest landscapes are dynamic and they are changing. Um, 
I think EUFOR needs to step up to the growing transitions that is taking place in the forestry sector around the globe. And adding a gender perspective is very helpful in terms of identifying how EUFOR can do that, how it can be made much more aware, and how it can take more timely efforts to maintain its relevance. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you. Uh, thought uh, evoking uh, viewpoints indeed. Uh, I think it's time to uh, move forward to the challenges part, to the second part of the panel uh, uh, trichotomy of questions. So I propose that we go uh, in the uh, opposite order. So we'll start with uh, Kalpana. So would you please uh, give your views? What do you think that are the, the, the greatest challenges on the way to, uh, to gender equality, to uh, inclusiveness and diversity? Please. Right, I think I would also like to, um, you know, talk about these challenges in relation to the initial context of knowledge divide, uh, the limits to representation within the network and partnership. Um, I would say that being a forester myself and having diverse into a little bit of more social and gender methodologies, I still see and, you know, like face that on a daily basis that there is a considerable divide between forest science and social sciences. And this is all around me with people who are working on similar topics, which are really, really important. So more often though, these sciences are actually understood as exclusive, right? So everyone is working on their own silos, doing something very important, not talking to each other. So the key challenge that I see within UFRO is you have so many different you know, units and people working on forest science generating data how to get this forest scientists, experts, to move towards more awareness, as well as adoption of transdisciplinary lenses to look at forest issues and knowledge framing. I think that's, that is a key challenge. Um, another challenge, and I think Barbara also men mentioned it in her flash talk, is that when we talk about gender equality, um, the initial premise to begin with is squaring it with head counting or representation. And it is very tricky thing because representation is actually needed to even create a space and bring a voice in the table that has previously not been there. But I think it is in, in it alone is not the solution, right? So there is a need to move beyond to analyze and improve institutional structures and power spaces uh, that you for as a network have hampering either access and opportunities of some while allowing it for others. So the whole challenge is how do we really move beyond uh, numeric representation uh, towards understanding gender equality as a factor for organizational development and investing much needed leadership efforts and resources to set up institutional governance and power relations in a way that is much more inclusive. Um, and third, I think, especially coming from the Southern geographies and having worked in Southeast Asia, especially with my previous organization, RECOF, um, what I really feel that though I was part of a UFRA as a network and I have been privileged to get access to this networking spaces, um, I would say that as a network, uh, UFRO has been heavily centered I would say on European geographies and issues. Uh, I think it is still needs a lot of work to extend its relationship with Southern best partners across different parts of the globe, including Southeast Asia and Asia. And I have, you know, like uh, worked with these organizations and these organizations do exist, but how, um, uh, like what is limiting in the current state of structure within the partnership and out, outreach model of UFRO, that these organizations are not really included within, within UFRO as a network. I think that, that is a question that, that appears challenging to me. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Kalpana. Let's take uh, viewpoints from uh, Teresa next. Thanks. Um, sometimes I think that when you ask about the challenges, the student's perspective is sometimes still like, two steps ahead or beyond, however you phrase it, because um, we see the lack of diversity and intersectionality on the student side in our lectures and all the time. So 
there is a lack of awareness already trying to enter the profession. So already seeing like who actually wants to become a forester, who goes to the field, who wants to study forestry science, that starts way earlier. And I know it's a big problem. It's a big structural problem we have, which we obviously cannot solve today and also not in the next year, but there are steps towards it. Um, but we have to take into account, and that's basically what we learned as a main challenge in the first year of the gender subcommission within IFSA, that we have similar problems all around the world. So there is a so-called other wing within the forestry scene of female forester. It's an unwelcoming climate. And of course, I don't want to generalize it, but those are experiences we have from all around the world. They are diverse in their interaction. So maybe on one side, they are smaller jokes. And on the other side, it's actually a question of not being allowed to cut the trees um, while paying the same tuition fees. But again, those small jokes, they have so much truth in there. So yeah, those are just big challenges um, going along with the lack of diversity within the lectures, but then also coming, or already talking about the next big step, which are the next big challenge, which are the persistent norms within Faustry. I think we've heard them before during the flash talks. Um, sometimes people just say like, oh, you know, it's just a smaller problem, but no, it's not. It's a big problem because on the individual base of every student, those small jokes can make a big difference if people actually pursue in this profession. So the leakage of female Faust students is quite big during the undergrad because there are just no big support structures. So the MOOC, which we heard about earlier, is one step towards it. And I'm sure a lot of places and a lot of things can actually come to work towards a more inclusive and yeah, more inclusive forestry sector and counteract those persistent norms. Um, but yeah, I guess we just have to be transparent and open about it, that these norms still exist and that these challenges exist. And that is very important for us as students. And then coming back to Ayufu, I think it's just this exemplary role, which I mentioned earlier. And this great idea of like, who is doing the knowledge? What are we researching? What are we focusing on? Should play a bigger role so that we as students can actually see ourselves and see those struggles within the network. Thank, Thank you, you, Teresa, for these very valuable viewpoints worth of considering for all of us indeed. And thank you for uh, John being patient, waiting for your turn. Let's take Alexander, what are your kind of a summarized challenges? Yes, thank you. First of all, I would like to say, Teresa, what you have now described as your personal experience as a student is actually also reflected in, in the, the research that has been undertaken more recently with regards to a, a forest education. So there has been a global forest education project, which uh, was implemented by UFO together with the FAO and ITTO. And uh, basically that confirms ex ex everything that you've just said about forest education. So there is really a, a problem there. And as you also pointed out, we need to start probably even before we, uh, the, the, the third level of education already start with the little ones and the school education to build that awareness that is later on needed also uh, to achieve more diversity and inclusivity in our uh, forest education systems around the globe. And that report, by the way, also involved partners from six regions of the world. So also to uh, respond um, to this very important aspect of regional views but let me talk uh, more uh, specifically about UFRO because I think there are significant barriers both internally and externally. Uh, internally, I think in UFRO they exist at two levels. First, um, the scientists themselves, uh, and uh, among them most importantly, the office holders, meaning those who coordinate the UFRO divisions, the research groups, the working parties, the task forces, and so on. And uh, um, regarding those individuals, I think it's the barrier is the attitude, the, um, you know, the, the mindset. Uh, people just, you know, lack, um, many of them, awareness about the significance of gender equality and including, you know, female office holders, female scientists. And uh, then there is this um, more institutional barrier. Of course, I mean, those scientists are employed by member organizations, predominantly the universities, the research institutions that constitute the membership of UFRO. And also there, there are significant barriers. Uh, what I hear on what we hear often from scientists from younger early career scientists is that they find it to be more difficult um, to access travel funds 
for example, to attend you for meetings. And uh, I think this is particularly true also for female early career scientists. So, so that of course has an, an, imp an impact then on the, on the inclusivity or lack of inclusivity of networking in UFRO. And then I also want to mention one uh, important external barrier in our experience, and that has to do with resource mobilization. Um, we really find it very difficult to find resources that could help UFRO um, to really, you know, do better in, for example, supporting the participation of scientists from all regions of the world, and especially female scientists in UFRO meetings and events and so on. And um, also, you know, you mentioned the MOOC that is being developed at the moment to find resources, to mobilize resources from our traditional donor base for these types of activities is, is a challenge. They tell us, you know, our priorities are poverty eradication, food insecurity, climate change. But these more cross-cutting themes uh, like uh, gender equality or education, they tend to fall between the cracks also in the donor community. Thank you. Let's hear the summarized challenges by John. Yes, I think uh, I think Teresa and and Kalpana and, and Alexander have covered covered the bases pretty well. But if there's something I can add, uh, it's it is just to remind everyone that uh, UFO is a voluntary network. So individuals are involved in UFO and they serve as office holders on a voluntary basis. So this is this has this has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, disadvantages is are that um, once once individuals develop you know develop their networks within UFRO, it tends to be a bit of uh, for, as for all of us some inertia in, in in how they how they operate. They have their own networks. They they may not be that inclined to expand the membership of their of their groups or or the scope of their activities. On the other side, but this is not I mean this is not a general statement because I think we have a great deal of openness among most office holders in UFRO. It's not universal towards inclusion. Uh, on the, the other side of this voluntary uh, service to UFRO is that individuals can develop new new lines of work within UFRO. This may not be generally appreciated. It often seems like the, the structure of UFRO is very rigid and so on, but it's, it is possible and it is, it is frequently done that uh, new units are created. So. So, um, so individuals that have taken interest and want to take some responsibility to organizing and managing new uh, new units within UFRO can do so. Um, one thing I would like to come back to is something that, that Alpena was was discussing uh, was uh, transdisciplinarity or interdisciplinary co collaboration within UFRO. Um, this is actually increasing uh, very rapidly as as we focus more on some of the larger challenges you know facing. You know, facing all of us, uh, whether it's climate change or forest lands, the need for forest landscape restoration, or a number of other issues. So we th these are inherently cross disciplinary uh, challenges, and UFO does invest uh, a lot of effort and a lot of donor support in in these directions. I mean, it's, our special programs and projects are particularly active in this area, engaging. Uh, scientists from around the world in across disciplines in addressing these and it's happening also at the divisional level in interdivisional inter activities and conferences so uh, it's improving you know, maybe it's not where we want to be necessarily it's, it's not getting there fast enough but we're we're definitely moving there and i think rather quickly so thank you thanks a lot for all of these thoughts uh, i think we could have a uh, several panels uh, of the challenges and also several panels about the, uh, the solutions and, and the actions. But we only have a limited time here. So let's move to the third question. Uh, what would be the, the concrete actions? And uh, I'm now kindly asking you to be concise, two minutes uh, each at maximum to allow some time for questions from the audience. And we'll start this time uh, from uh, Teresa. So what would you summarize as the, the, the most uh, uh, kind of a important uh, actions to take to uh, lead us towards the desired outcomes? Thanks. Um, yeah, I guess uh, coming again from on the ground, from the student's perspective, I think uh, it's a great chance to be here to talk about it and for the EU Food Task Force to spread awareness. So that actually, I hope lectures in the room would actually take this into account and into the universities.
because what we are currently missing are really programs, mentoring workshop and safer spaces for female forestry students to get together to talk. That's what we experienced in the last year of the gender subcommission that you know, we had online workshops with people around the world and it was like the first time they actually talked to each other. It was the first time they could speak up about gender equality, about the discrimination they experienced. So I really just hope that today and the upcoming work by the Youth Task Force will motivate you to take it to your students. And with that, I yeah, just want to stress also that building and providing networks is very important for students. There has been a lot of research that social groups, like social groups providing support can actually strengthen students and um, thereby also just making the point that it's not, I mean, we heard that earlier as well, it's not but just about the female students or non-binary, it's about everybody. It's about allyship from male students and it's important that everybody addresses this, that gender is not just one topic, but it is included as an overall and holistic perspective within the study. Hope there was Thank you. <laughs> Let's uh, give uh, the turn to Kalpana, please. All right. I think very concisely, maybe I would also uh, uh, start with uh, the need of nurturing the space for conversations, uh, just like the one that we are having right now. I think they are extremely important, especially when we are talking about topics of inequality or inequality and how do we better address them? Because there's no one magic formula or solution, right? And uh, changes do take time. People need to rewire their brains if they are coming from attitude issues or they have to reset up institutions in a much more holistic way so that these issues can be uh, addressed much more deliberately. But the whole point is that, um, you know, it always requires a sustained effort of committed people, uh, their leadership, dedicated tax groups and resources. And that really needs to be maintained, I think, throughout UFRO. So conversation spaces like this and follow-up actions um, and investment into these follow-up actions would, would really help to solve the challenges. Um, I would also say that uh, the solution would be breezing the knowledge divide between different sciences uh, would be really helpful. How do we really, um, you know, like, create different knowledges, different nuanced knowledges of what forest is and what forest science is, and really impart that to educational institutions. I think if we are able to do that, we can create a new genre or new cadre of you know, foresters who would approach forest and forest systems much more holistically than how I, <laughs> I was trained you know, like 20 years ago. So I think that needs to change. And one way of doing that is also extending the partnership. I think UFRA is a huge network, so it can actually leverage on its network and it can invite different partners, especially from the Southern geographies on how forests are changing. What is the new need of science and knowledge to address those type of issues? And perhaps bring those type of issues to the donors. And, also initiate a conversation, you know, like influencing donors with the new set of knowledge that you have grounded. So extend those partnerships and extend those knowledge base. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will leave the last uh, turn to Alexander who has more operational view on you for network actions. So I give the, uh, the next turn to John. Yes, thank you. Um, I mean, throughout this discussion, we, we've stressed the importance of, of, of leadership and this, the, the, the institutional structures of, of UFRO and how it's important to, um, to, to, to make progress in that area. And I think Gun's introductory presentation and, and the, the work of the task force generally and what Elias uh, um, discussed was, is really important and we take that to heart. We're actually making, we're taking a giant leap forward in that direction, uh, beginning with the next UFRO board period, which will be beginning after the, the Congress in Stockholm. Uh, we, we will have a, an, a, much, in, a, a much larger um, UFRO board. And beginning with that board period, we, it, we have made it a requirement that all the division coordinators, will be, there'll now be two division coordinators for each division, co-coordinators, and 
one one of the these co-coordinators needs to be either female and or preferably from underrepresented regions of UFRO. The result of this will be a leadership structure at the very top, which will look very much like the, the world that we live in. And will, we feel will much better represent the interests of, um, of both of women and of, um, of different regions of the world that are currently not properly represented. So that's one concrete measure we're taking. Thank you, handing over to Alexander. Thank you. Um, yes, perhaps really uh, talking more about these operational issues, if I may use that term. Um, the UFRO, uh, at, in, at the UFRO headquarters, it's not only the secretary which provides the administrative support and deals with the communication, but there are also a number of so-called special programs and projects and initiatives, one of them being the special program for development of capacities. And that, of course, plays a very instrumental role also in you know, advancing gender equality in the network. Um, and here I can say that, for example, uh, in terms of participation of scientists uh, from economically uh, disadvantaged countries regions you know it's there's a very clear rule in the SBDC that uh, that half of the the participants in training activities must be female uh, there's also an age limit by the way so to to just you know also make sure that you know early career younger scientists benefit from that opportunity uh, the same holds true for what is called the scientist assistance program that provides travel support uh, to scientists for attending UFO meetings and events and uh, of course, we are continuously committed towards, you know, uh, enhancing the, the level of uh, resources that we can mobilize for the work of the SBDC. Another um, uh, program that we have is called the Global First Expert Panels. That is an, uh, an initiative at the science policy interface. And once more, it is a very clear requirement for any any such panel that you know um, half of the uh, the panel members would be female and we heard yesterday you heard the the forest and health um session and that actually is about the next uh, the the upcoming new global forest expert panel report so here this is another mechanism and the same is true for another project we have which is uh, called the special project world forest society and environment also an initiative at the science policy interface in the lunch break, we are going to have the directors forum. That is a group that brings together the heads of the member organizations. And it, it seems to me that really this topic is also very pertinent for, for, for the group of the, the heads of the member organizations. So I would also welcome you know, ideas and thoughts about also how that could be used to advance this um, more strongly. And as a last point, of course, we all look very much forward to hearing the recommendations by the task force itself, the action plan, uh, because that, of course, uh, can help us, you know, uh, make further progress also on in other areas that uh, we may not yet be fully aware of or uh, not less knowledgeable about. Thank you, Alexander. I think the task force will gladly accept the ball that you passed uh, back to us, and we will definitely be working hard to, to find a, an operational and, and well-reasoned uh, action plan uh, with your kind support. Uh, now we have some 15 minutes time uh, to engage uh, the audience uh, uh, from uh, this auditorium and also from online. Uh, I'm asking the online uh, participants uh, monitoring uh, crew if there are any interesting questions coming from, uh, from online participants. Yes, um, we had a comment here in the chat uh, about that uh, it's someone that uh, raised the issue that it's great that UFRO is uh, highlighting these issues uh, and also that it potentially could have an impact on the members organization. So maybe that's a, if we were phrased as, as, a, as a question instead and, and then ask the panel about how do you see the relation between sort of the, with regards to this type of topics between the, the UFRO and their role and their relation to their member organizations and what opportunities could there be uh, to, to build on these issues? Very good question, very good question. Uh, who wants to answer first? John, please. I'll start. I mean, the, the, given the nature of UFRO and how it operates, the fact that we're a, a, net, we're a network of scientists, we're also a, an organization composed of member organizations, and all that complexity that, that Elias pointed to. There are things we can do directly. There are things we cannot do directly. The, the things we can do directly have to do with our leadership structure in UFRO. 
grow the the areas of work within the the active units we can we, you know we have some influence over that we do we have much less influence in my view over over our members and their policies and how they um how they engage with these issues um you know we can we can try to set a good example however and i think that's really important alexander i don't know perhaps you want to add to that please well, perhaps what I can add, of course, I mean, Euphra as a, as a global platform also kind of has visibility and therewith also interact, uh, influence also on uh, member organizations and on how they being perceived and so on, like the, like the soft rule that can be established uh, in a way. And I think uh, through sessions such as this one and through communicating about this actively, of course, we can kind of set up a positive standard <laughs> and kind of nudge uh, those that are lagging behind also into um, uh, making more progress and more swiftly to, uh, in working towards gender equality. Anything else from the panelists? No need to have a full round. We got some answers for the good question. Uh, please, online particip participants, keep uh, doing your uh, thinking. And if you have some uh, striking, uh, important, burning question in your head, please write it down in the chat. We'll, we'll have the opportunity to take that. But now I'm opening the opportunity for the uh, auditorium participants here in Vienna if you have any questions. So we'll have a uh, at least uh, a couple of. Uh, the first one over there, please. Thank you very much. My name is Dagmar Karish Gira. I'm working for the Chamber of Agriculture and Forestry in Styria, and I'm also the chairwoman of the Austrian Association for Women in Forestry, the Forstfrauen. I don't have a question, but I guess I have some good news, especially for you, for the students. Uh, for the last two years, we have been working on an interact Danube transnational project together with uh, 14 partners from 10 countries on ways how to support the inclusion of women in forestry. We did some research work. Today we heard of Barbara Ellora's work and what she found out confirms what we found out. And on this basis, we developed some measures to support women. We um, uh, developed training measures, training activities. We developed a mentoring program on transnational level and on national level. And that's what we are going to uh, carry on during the next years. The mentoring program on national level will start, we hope so, next year. And we, of course, want to include also students. We address women all over forestry for the whole sector, for the timber and forestry sector, not only students and researchers, but as guests that gives them maybe a wider range, a wider reach. And, and uh, what's also maybe important for you and interesting for you, that's also an invitation. Uh, one of the outcomes of the project is that there are so many networks for women in forestry in Europe and all over the world. And very soon we decided that we wanna keep these contacts we had within the project over the duration of the project. And right at the moment, we are on the way to found an association, an umbrella association for all these networks to keep them together. And please take that as an invitation because we address women all over forestry, not only research work. So we, if we are in close contact, we have a wider network. And I guess uh, that's a reach this way. And so I'm here at the poster presentation. So everybody is interested in uh, coming into closer contact, please visit me there. And I'm looking forward to also to the cooperation with you, Fro. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was a very valuable piece of information. Uh, more like a comment. Thanks for the good work. Do uh, you have any reflection, quick uh, response from the panel? Alexander? No, only very quickly, uh, since Dagmar took the floor, I, I want to mention, you know, that, you know, there was, has been an excellent collaboration with uh, Dagmar's organization, the first found in Austria, for a conference which we had, Dagmar, when was it? <laughs> It was last year on first in women's hands, I think it has also been mentioned by the Director General in Austria in the opening, uh, together with Boko uh, and uh, the Austrian Ministry, so that was an excellent collaboration, and I think some of what you mentioned kind of perhaps it was the breeding ground also for some of this. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, there, please.
Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, you for to take up this very, very important issue. Uh, but um, from the panel discussion, as well as from the, from the survey that was presented, I um, don't want to take this message that gender inclusion is restricted only to male and female. So it was always uh, from the discussion coming to that, that we want to raise uh, the inclusion of female uh, colleagues in forestry. Absolutely, that is very, very important, but we should not also forget that gender does not only mean male and female, but there are other genders, also no genders. Just to give you an example, how deeply this problem is enshrined in our work. Uh, by the way, I come from the Austrian Research Center for Forest BFW, uh, located in Vienna. Only last month, uh, no, two months ago, I was drafting uh, an advertisement uh, to hire a postdoc in my group. And I drafted uh, the, the advertisement. And of course, I forgot to include the, the line about that we want to in, uh, raise the uh, inclusion of other genders, but it was included from my HR, I think that uh, we want to raise uh, the inclusion of qualified female representatives. But then you see that this is not present in our psyche to think about gender outside this binary of male and female. So I, I really would appreciate if you throw uh, things in, in this direction. Thanks. Thank you. Is there any quick comment from the panelists, please, uh, Teresa? Yeah, may I just add on it? Um, we, as the Gender Subcommission, we actually recently published an open letter, and I really want to thank you for that comment because I missed my note. <laughs> that we always use the term finter, so female, inter, trans, non-binary, and agender, and with a little mark for everybody who's discriminated by the patriarchal society. So I, I'm very strongly on your side. We need to think about the diversity of genders. And also like, I don't know, it's such a big structural problem and like in every little form, in every little step, and like every time you have to choose sir or madam, you have to choose Mr. or Miss. Mrs. It's, yeah, it's such a big problem. And I really thank you for bringing up that pro, uh, problem because it is, yeah, a part of the everyday life of several students. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, do we have a question or comment in the, in the chat? No? Okay. Uh, unfortunately, I think we need to move on. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, one quick question from the audience. There was one uh, hand raised over there, that side. Who was the one who wants to ask the quick question? Yes, please. Thank you. I'm Macy Dechi from Ghana. Mine is also not a question, but to add up to. First of all, let me take this opportunity to thank the task force. It's a very good work done. Let us all reflect. There are three key, for me, three key cross-cutting issues, but they don't have equal attention. And one is gender. The other is climate change, which has global attention with all the funds. And the other is COVID, which all of us don't want to talk about it, which is good because it's not the best. So it is really good that I throw with it task force is paying great attention to gender. And it comes back to what uh, earlier speaker said. And Teresa, I think you made mention of it. You made mention of intersectionality, which is very key. So I will plead with the uh, task force that as part of looking into diversity inclusion, we should also pay attention to intersectionality. We break down the social identities as we look at example like age, we look down the different levels and that will enrich the work. Thank you very much. Thank you for this comment. I think this is um, uh, not something that panelists need to respond, but let's take everybody this uh, kind of message from you. Uh, now, unfortunately, uh, we are approaching the end of this uh, panel and end of this session. Uh, so I just remind everybody that uh, uh, gender equality is uh, uh, task and challenge 
and the action point for everybody. So please, if you have something in your heads uh, moving around, please continue with your colleagues during the breaks and during the, the forthcoming uh, events. Now, uh, let me move to the point uh, to reveal the, the great secret. So the Mentimeter uh, results. Uh, Jose, would you be so kind to show us what uh, kind of response distribution and word cloud we have uh, been able to generate together today? Well, here we are. We have the result of the vote, very important, uh, the highest bar for the first question, medium important, also quite uh, uh, relevant and uh, well, uh, not many responses on the, on the right hand side. Okay, next one. Waiting, waiting. All right. Well, you can read, obviously, I'm not going to be uh, interpreting everything. So let's uh, take that as a response uh, distribution. Let's move on to the next one. The third uh, multiple choice question. Uh, yeah, that's a little bit different. Interesting. We'll take that in the task force and consider what that might mean. And then here comes the word cloud. Uh, communication, openness, respect, uh, etc. Very helpful, very uh, insightful and interesting. Thank you very much for all of your uh, contributions to these questions. So this was not only for this panel, uh, not only for this session, but this is uh, uh, for us, everybody, for the task force to take on and continue the work uh, towards the, the Stockholm uh, you for World Congress uh, 2024 and beyond. Uh, let's stay tuned. And with this, uh, I just uh, cannot conclude the panel with, uh, with one minute. I just say that uh, there were very many important insights of the relevance of the challenges and, and concrete action proposals that we will be working together in the coming years. Thank you very much, panelists and the audience. And I'm now handing over to Gun for the final summary remarks of this session. Gun, please. Yes, thank you all for uh, being so active and the inputs that we have got to the task force as I uh, the work of the task force because what I said this is an ongoing work and uh, actually the action plan was mentioned but it's not a task force that will produce the action plan we will produce the basis for the action plan that will be discussed uh, in in the UFRO uh, uh, network on different levels uh, the, the year and a half to come. Uh, and um, so uh, also talking about what's next. Yes, uh, Dagmar here mentioned that uh, she will present a poster uh, today, and then will also be another poster to, uh, in the poster session, the presentation by Elias. Uh, but uh, your opportunity to, to make a, a further uh, contribution to our work will be the follow-up survey, uh, similar to one that uh, Elias displayed some results from. Uh, this time the, the survey will be uh, launched to all those who have registered for this conference. Uh, in, uh, in contrast to the previous that was uh, directed to office holders only. So by doing so, uh, we think that we can have even more input uh, with regards to inclusion and diversity, uh, because uh, some of you are office holders, but others are not. So please um, respond to this survey. And it will be launched uh, today by lunchtime. And, and there will be like three weeks for you to, to respond.
respond to it, but I hope that you will do it uh, when you ke have keep this session in mind. Then, uh, as Elias also mentioned, uh, we are working on completing the organization and analysis. Some interviews will be made and um, also more of the theoretical um, frames will be added to the analysis. Uh, we are doing a number of, of um, uh, gender equality initiative analysis, uh, and we will start to compare those we already have uh, to find out or to hopefully bring forth some in insights where whether different initiatives have been more or less successful and why. Uh, we are working on, uh, on making a, um, a list of, of gender expertise that uh, will be launched on the new UFRO website, uh, because we think that um, out uh, in, in the world also, uh, if, gen if gender is um, a, a such an important issue that's in forestry that we have heard about, not only our member organizations or our members uh, will look for some to ask, someone to ask, an, an expert in different fields. Uh, so this is hopefully something that will be helpful. Uh, but uh, then, of course, I would like to underline the importance of the development of this massive online, open online course for gender equality, uh, which uh, I think is a very important tool and leverage for making a change. Um, yeah, and then uh, with regards to the upcoming UFRO Congress, uh, in, in Stockholm 2024. Uh, we have offered our expertise and our knowledge and competence uh, to help organizing gender equality themes and activities during the Congress. So um, I would like to um, end my talk uh, by this um, picture um, showing one of the first conferences and activities that we had uh, on the theme of gender equality. This was in 2006, uh, and um, it was a great opportunity to, to gather not only people involved in UFRO, but also in uh, women, women's network broadly. Uh, and uh, the message here, the take home message here is also, uh, we need to be persistent. We cannot change things uh, from one day or another. And there is no, uh, let's say, one single tool to do it. Uh, that said, I thank you all for participating, for giving these important inputs to the our work as a task force. 